All right, guys. Well, welcome. Uh, we are here today. Um, thanks for joining us for our workshop that we're going to be talking on building a comfortable retirement. Uh, my name is Ken Toops. I'm a financial advisor here with the Florida Credit Union uh, with Cuso Financial, and I'm joined with my colleague, uh, Jerry Johnson. And uh, today we're going to be bringing you some information uh, we hope you find useful. Um, if you haven't already done so, what you might want to do is go ahead and uh, maybe grab a notepad and a, a pen or paper, pen and paper, uh, something to just jot some notes down. Um, we will have a time to answer questions after this. Uh, if you see on our menu, uh, there should be a questions tab. And if you go ahead and if a uh, question pops up, if you want to just type that in, uh, we should have some time at the end of this presentation to answer a few of those questions. Um, but you'll see our contact information below our names here. Uh, if you want to jot those down, uh, if you have any questions that you don't want to ask today, uh, Jerry and I would be happy to answer those questions uh, more personally. So this will be our disclaimer page. This will be a great time for you to go get that uh, if you need anything. Okay, so let's talk about retirement. So when thinking about retirement, how do you envision it? How do you see retirement for you specifically? And I know that answer is gonna be a lot different for everybody. Um, some people might look forward to taking up new hobbies. Uh, maybe you wanna travel. Um, maybe you wanna go back to school and challenge yourself. Uh, maybe you just simply wanna spend more time with friends and family, uh, do the, the rest and relaxation. Uh, whatever it is, there's a lot to look forward to in retirement and retirees are living a lot longer these days so some of you might be retired for as long as you actually worked in your working career so saving up uh, retirement assets is more important than ever so saving for retirement might at first seem a little bit daunting i mean you have your everyday expenses you, you have your bills you have your mortgage uh, maybe you're saving for college expenses, uh, and then not to mention just the high prices of everyday life, which I know we all, all know right now. Um, but how do you make saving for retirement a high priority uh, when it can be so far down the road? Uh, it's important to understand why you need to save and plan so far ahead, and then figure out the how to balance those challenges, uh, today's challenges, with tomorrow's goals that you have. Uh, just the fact that you being here today is a great step towards being comfortable in retirement. Uh, we're going to explore a few whys and hows and look at the actions that you need to take for both of those for your future. So let's talk about the three keys to funding a comfortable retirement. Uh, first, you're going to need to evaluate retirement income needs. Now, I know this is going to be different for everybody. Um, but when you can determine what your retirement income needs, this is going to help you understand all of those important whys, all of those factors that will influence your personal situation, uh, as well as looking at some of the income sources that you may have available to you in retirement, such as uh, Social Security, uh, pension income, if you're lucky enough to have a pension. Um, and then next, we're going to look at the hows, um, which are going to be the bulk of our conversation today. Um, how do you develop a strategy to pursue your retirement savings goal? Uh, we're going to walk through a few retirement saving tools, um, and then we're going to explore the process of building a retirement investment portfolio. Uh, finally, we're going to spend a little bit of time covering how to protect that retirement nest egg that you've built. So let's discuss a few steps in more detail. So some factors that can influence your retirement income the whys. So there's a lot of factors that are influence how much income you're going to actually need in retirement. And like I mentioned before, everybody's situation is different. So these whys that we're going to go over are some of the most important reasons of why you need to make retirement planning an important financial goal in your lifetime. So some of these reasons are the age when you plan to retire. How long do you think you're going to be in retirement for? Uh, you need to plan for the health care needs and expenses that come along with those. Uh, the effects of inflation, uh, which I know we've all seen up close and personal right now. 
Uh, and of course, we have to know what kind of lifestyle that you actually envision in retirement. So let's talk about the first one, the retirement age. So ask yourself, do you already have an age in mind that you'd like to retire? And I know a lot of us probably say sooner than later, but really think about what age do you think you'd be comfortable retiring? Uh, this is so important because the earlier you retire, well, that's the shorter amount of time that you actually have to accumulate assets for retirement which also means that those funds are going to need to last a lot longer. Um, there's no minimum age for retirement, uh, but many people are going to target around the age that they're eligible for Social Security income. Uh, you can claim Social Security income as early as age 62, but just remember that every year that you defer, you'll receive a, a larger retirement check. Um, we're going to talk more about Social Security a little bit later on, though. Um, also, another thing to consider is you're not eligible for Medicare until the age of 65. So if you plan to retire before the age of 65, you're going to need to factor in those private health care costs. Now let's take a look at this graph. So keep in mind that you can't always control what age you retire. Uh, so a recent survey found that the ages when workers expect to retire were actually later than the actual ages when those retirees left the workforce. Uh, in fact, a good majority of retirees said they retired prior to the age of 65 uh, for a lot of reasons that were actually beyond their control. So consider the possibility that you might be unable to continue working because of maybe it's poor health, uh, maybe there's layoffs going on at your company, downsizing, uh, you, you name it. Um, but this is a major reason why it's important to save for retirement throughout your life. Uh, you can never really be too sure of what the future is going to hold, so you definitely want to try to have the best plan possible and execute that plan. So next we're going to take a look at the length of retirement. So with the length of retirement, with recent advances in technology and medicine, our life expectancy is stretching considerably. Now that's a good thing and maybe a, a not so good thing, you know, depending on how well you've done saving for retirement. So as you can see, chances are really good that you'll be spending a large portion of your life in retirement. In fact, according to this, a 65 year old in average health can expect to live another 20 to 25 years. So are you prepared and is your retirement account prepared uh, to live that long? So let's look at healthcare needs. So longevity is related to healthcare. So this is our third factor to consider. Uh, the chart that we're looking at right now shows that in three out of the last four years, healthcare costs increased at a faster pace than our general inflation. And that trend may well continue, even though, well, we know that inflation has definitely ramped up lately. Um, as a result, fewer employees are offering health care benefits to retirees, and many that do offer those benefits are actually scaling those benefits back. Medicare benefits remain at current levels. It's estimated that a 65-year-old couple who retired in 2021 will live an average life expectancy and have average prescription drug expenses that might need nearly $300,000 just to pay their health expenses in retirement. That's a lot of money. So under the circumstances, it's little wonder why paying uh, for medical expenses has become one of the biggest worries for retirees. Um, and one of the most important reasons to plan ahead, quite frankly. Uh, during retirement, you won't have to make sacrifices in other areas of your budget in order to pay those medical bills. Now let's talk about inflation. And this is something that's very timely. Uh, inflation is another important factor that you really need to consider that can have a huge effect on the amount that you'll need to save for retirement. Um, just so you know, inflation is the rise of consumer prices over time. Um, because inflation makes it more expensive to buy the things that you need to live comfortably from day to day, that can lower the value of your savings from year to year. So in other words, a dollar today is not going to be worth a dollar tomorrow. 
Um, the table that we're looking at right now is showing how low a 3% inflation rate could affect the cost of everyday items over 20 years. Um, the purchasing power of your money would be cut nearly in half, and that's assuming only a 3% inflation. Keep in mind where we're at right now, and it's much, much higher. Um, so over the past 30 year period, um, ending in 2021, inflation averaged about 2.4% on an annual basis. Um, but this average is hiding those years of unexpected spikes. Um, inflation in 2021, for an example, was 7%, and it got up into the, the 8 and 9% last year. So you can't just factor in the averages of, of 3% because you can have these outlier years that will drastically impact your retirement savings. Now, as for lifestyle, the last retirement income factor that we're gonna consider is your lifestyle. So unlike the other factors, this one is largely under your control. Uh, an example of this is, you know, you may travel, uh, you may plan to travel extensively. Um, maybe you want to volunteer your time a lot more. Um, maybe maintain a membership at the local country club. You know, whatever that lifestyle is to you uh, is going to impact how much you're going to need to save. Um, maybe you just simply want to spend time reading and relaxing and playing board games with your grandchildren. Um, but depending on your specific goals, you may need anywhere from 70 to 100% of your pre-retirement income to live that comfortable lifestyle in retirement. Now, in retirement, we have our possible sources of income. So we've looked at some of the factors that can affect our retirement savings and income needs. The next question we need to ask ourselves is, what resources do we have available for us? Um, the main one that a lot of people depend on is going to be Social Security income. You can even throw work pensions in this category, even though pensions are becoming a little bit less common. Um, maybe you have continued employment earnings, uh, personal savings and investments uh, can bridge a gap in your income. Uh, and that can include both pre-tax and uh, a taxable account. Um, so really, who knows how long Social Security is going to last in its current form? Uh, we mentioned pensions are becoming less and less common, so it's really more important than ever for you to fund your own retirement. Let's talk about that first source of income. Let's talk about Social Security. So Social Security benefits are based on two factors, your highest 35 years of earnings in the workforce and the age when you uh, start to claim those benefits. So if you retire at your full retirement age, so either age 66 or 67, uh, depending on your birth year, um, you're gonna receive your full social security benefit. However, you can choose to retire as early as age 62, uh, you'll just receive a reduced benefit amount. Um, that could be as much as 25 to 30% less than your full retirement benefit. So if you retire later, and you can actually uh, take social security all the way up to age 70, uh, you will be receiving a larger benefit amount the longer you wait to take Social Security. Um, Social Security does currently replace about 40% of your pre-retirement income. Uh, the estimated average monthly Social Security benefit for all retired workers in 2022 is $1,657 a month. Uh, typically, the monthly benefit increases annually uh, to help with the inflation that we talked about. However, there's definitely been years where there's not been increases, um, and actually, uh, the overall inflation rate was too low to trigger that increase. Um, now, if you want to visit, you can go to ssa.gov forward slash my account, and you can actually create your own personal Social Security account on the Social Security website, and you can view your estimated benefits online. And I know it sounds a little silly, but let's say in retirement, you decide that you want to continue working somewhere. Well, continued employment earnings can also help provide some income during retirement. Nearly three fourths of workers in one survey said they plan to continue working to pay for after they reach, or reach retirement age. Um, however, consider that just 30% of the current retirees said they have actually worked uh, for pay in retirement. 
So although it's a good, you know, to hope for the best, you really need to consider that about 46% of today's retirees stopped working earlier than they had planned, um, often because of those unexpected reasons that we had talked about. Um, so the best way to prepare for the unexpected in retirement may be to try to save enough so that you're, just in case you're unable to work for pay, you can still enjoy the kind of retirement lifestyle that you envisioned. Now, another way to get retirement income is going to be through personal savings and investments. So personal savings and investments are gonna make up a bulk of retirement income for a lot of today's workers. Um, people are often gonna to choose to save for retirement using those tax deferred accounts, um, such as 401ks, uh, 403bs. Um, I, I know we're a teacher's credit union, so there's a lot of state employees uh, you know, through the DROP program uh, and individual retirement accounts. Um, annuities are also an additional option to consider. Um, some investors supplement their tax deferred savings and investments by investing in stocks, bonds, uh, CDs, uh, you have your mutual funds, uh, exchange traded funds, different types of investments like those. And that's something where Jerry and I can come in and help you out, uh, determine what's right for you. Um, we're gonna discuss each one of these options a bit more in detail in the next section. So let's look at how powerful tax deferral can be. So let's take a look at this graph here. So generally, deferring current taxes can really help you save money. Um, that's why so many people choose to contribute to one of these employer-sponsored retirement plans or a traditional IRA. Um, when you contribute funds to a tax deferred account, you pay no current taxes on the contributions or any earnings until you withdraw those funds, usually in retirement. Um, this may allow your savings to accumulate at a faster pace over time because your full contribution is working for you. Um, so let's take a look at this, this chart here, and let's assume that you have $20,000 to invest. You put $10,000 into a taxable account, and we're going to assume that earns 6% annual, and you're going to use a portion of these assets to pay taxes um, from the earnings. And then we're going to put the other $10,000 into a tax deferred account like a 401k or, or like an IRA. And we're also going to assume the 6% annual return. So if we assumed we're going to pick the 24% tax rate. And in 30 years, that taxable account would be worth about $38,000. Now that tax deferred account would be worth $57,000. So that can really show you how tax deferral can work in your favor. Um, now, even if the funds were invested in the tax deferred account um, are subject to federal income tax upon withdrawal, um, as they would be, you know, if you made a pre-tax contribution to a 401k plan, you're still coming out ahead. Um, this is true even if you took the entire amount in the tax deferred account as a lump sum distribution after 30 years and paid tax on the full amount. Now, again, assuming a 24% tax rate, you would still end up with $43,600, which is more than the 38,000. Okay, now let's talk about the three keys to funding a comfortable retirement plan. So once you've set up a retirement savings goal, the second key is gonna to be to develop a strategy to obtain that goal. Um, that's going to involve understanding the variety of, of tools um, and putting together an investment portfolio, uh, you know, that you're comfortable with and that you're going to meet those goals. Um, again, everybody's family is going to be different. Everybody's needs are different and circumstances are different. So that's, again, where something working with Jerry or I, you know, we can help develop a strategy for you. Um, first, we're going to take a look at a few common tax deferred tools, and then we're going to start discuss some taxable investment options. Um, we're going to finish this section up by getting into the investment portfolio details. So work-based retirement savings plan. So these are going to be plans like your 401ks, uh, 401as, 403bs, um, those type of employer-sponsored retirement plans. Um, and these plans offer a number of benefits. So first, you generally are gonna contribute a percentage of your salary using pre-tax funds. 
Uh, you don't have to pay current taxes on contributions or any earnings until you withdraw that money from your retirement plan. Um, and that generally occurs in retirement. Um, so as we discussed, this can greatly enhance. When we looked at the slide previously on that uh, chart, you can see how, how powerful tax deferral can be um, inside of these plans. Um, in addition to making pre-tax contributions, uh, they may help lower your current income tax liability. So in other words, you might have to pay less taxes um, for that year you're making these contributions um, or get more money back. Um, employers may offer to match a percentage on some of these plans, um, which is also a huge, huge benefit. Um, it's essentially extra money that's provided by your employer to help you save for retirement. So you definitely want to make sure you're taking advantage of that if that's offered. Um, defined contribution plans are going to be subject to federal contribution limits. So in 2022, workers can contribute up to $20,500 to a 401k or a 403b, and workers who are age 50 or older can actually contribute an additional $6,500 as what they call a catch-up provision. Um, so you also want to consider uh, you also want to remember the distributions from most work-based retirement plans are taxed as ordinary income. So withdrawals taken prior to age 59 and a half, you could be subject to a 10% early withdrawal penalty. Uh, another thing to consider is the required minimum distributions, which we're going to talk a little bit more on um, as we go on with this um, presentation. But generally, required minimum distributions from a tax-deferred retirement plan must begin in the year in which you reach age 72. Uh, that is going to be changing, and Jerry's going to talk with you about that um, in just a few slides. So let's talk about Roth contributions. So you guys probably have heard between traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs. Um, you may also be able to make a Roth contribution. Uh, Roth contributions are going to be made with after-tax dollars, meaning that you're not going to get any immediate tax savings. Um, however, the account can grow, and when you take money out, can be tax-free. So as long as you meet certain conditions, the earnings in a Roth account will be entirely free of federal income tax. Now, the limits for Roth 401k contributions are the same as the limits for the pre-tax contributions, so $20,500 um, up to $27,000 if you're 50 or older, uh, but the annual limit applies to your total pre-tax and after-tax contributions. So, in other words, you can have a Roth account and you can have a traditional, but you cannot exceed those contribution limits between the two accounts. Um, in order for a distribution from your Roth account to be tax-free, you have to meet a few um, qualifications. So you must satisfy a five-year holding requirement, and you must have reached age 59 and a half or be disabled when you receive that first payment from your Roth account. Um, if you receive a non-qualified distribution, uh, your payment's generally going to include your own contributions. Uh, which are non-taxable and prorated portion of earnings, uh, which will be subject to income tax and a potential 10% early distribution penalty if you're under the age of 59 and a half. Uh, now, Roth contributions are going to be treated the same as pre-tax contributions for all other work-based plan purposes. Uh, so, for an example, um, access to your funds is generally limited while you're still employed, uh, your employer can still make uh, matching contributions to the Roth side, um, although any employer contributions that go into your pre-tax account, um, and you may be able to borrow from your Roth account. Again, that's going to depend on your 401k or your 403b. Um, so whether you should make pre-tax or Roth contributions really depends on your personal goals and circumstances. Again, if you have questions on this, this is something Jerry and I would love to sit down with to help determine which might be best for you. Now, we just talked about Roth. Let's talk about the traditional side. So IRAs are another real popular way to save for retirement on a tax-deferred basis. Um, there's two main types of IRAs. Uh, we just talked about Roth, but then we also have our traditional IRAs. Um, 
Anyone who has earned income from a job can actually make contributions to an IRA, but it is important to note that you have to have earned income. And they look at earned income as, for example, like wages, uh, commissions, salaries. Um, what would not be considered earned income would be, say, like Social Security or, or pensions, you know, any other type of retirement income. Um, so a traditional IRA is going to offer a number of benefits. Um, contributions to a traditional IRA are generally tax deductible. Um, and then if you participate in a work-based retirement plan and your income exceeds certain limits, you may not get the tax deduction. Um, but your contributions in any earnings will actually accumulate tax deferred. So if we remember a few slides back, how powerful that can be in investments when you don't have to pay taxes yearly. Um, so it, it can make a huge difference in your retirement savings. Um, IRAs may offer a broader range of investment options than you have in your work retirement plans. So typically 403Bs, 401Ks are going to be very limited on what you can invest in, whereas IRAs uh, you typically are going to have many, many, many more options available to you. And if you ask me, options are a good thing. Um, now IRAs are subject to lower federal contribution limits than most work-based plans. So where we talked about the maximum amount that you can contribute to your work uh, employer sponsored retirement plans, you'll have less that you can contribute to a traditional IRA. Um, so if you're under the age of 50, you can contribute up to $6,500 per year 2023, and you can do up to $7,500 um, if you are over the age of 50. Um, and as is the case with a work-based retirement plan, you generally are going to be getting taking your required minimum distributions once you hit the age of 73, which is the current age. Um, but again, Jerry's going to be talking about how that age is going to change um, over the next coming years. Um, another thing to consider with traditional IRAs, though, um, distributions from a traditional IRA are going to be taxed as ordinary income. And if you take a withdrawal prior to the age of 59 and a half, if you don't meet certain exceptions, you're still looking at a 10% early withdrawal penalty. So it can be a little on the expensive side uh, to take money out early of these retirement plans. So we talked about Roth 401ks. So let's talk about the Roth IRAs. And generally they work much like a traditional with a few important differences. So Roth IRA, it's become really attractive in recent years. Um, the difference from a traditional is that the contributions are made with after-tax dollars. Um, any in, in qualified Roth distributions are typically going to be free of federal income tax. Um, any earnings also will accumulate tax deferred. Um, so having a tax-free source of income could be very beneficial in retirement because distributions aren't included in your taxable income, and so that would not affect your Social Security benefits. Uh, having a tax-free source of income could be beneficial in retirement. Um, oh, sorry, just read that part. <laughs> um, but if you are the original owner of the Roth IRA, you never have to take an R&D out of a Roth. Um, that's a big difference between a traditional. So once you hit the age of 73 inside of a Roth IRA, if you don't need to take the money out of it, you're not required to do so. Um, now, Roth IRAs are subject to the same contribution limits as traditional IRAs. So again, up to $6,500, um, assuming you've earned at least that much for the current tax year, all the way up to $7,500 if you're over the age of 50. And just like your 401 and 403Bs, your Roth and your traditional IRAs cannot exceed that amount However, you can make contributions to both. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn this over to Jerry, and uh, he's going to talk about the SECURE Act. Good afternoon. Good uh, morning to all of you on the West Coast. So I'm going to be starting the presentation regarding the SECURE Act. Um, this is legislation that was just recently passed by Congress and, uh, and signed into law. Um, this is the SECURE Act 2. SECURE Act 1, the biggest change it did was it changed the uh, requirement minimum distribution age from 70 and a half to 72. 
Secure Act 2 changes it beginning this year to 73. So you have to start, you don't have to start taking required minimum distributions until you turn the year you turn 73. Now in 2030, it'll go to 74, in 2033, it'll go to 75. But the biggest things that hit here is the change in the required minimum distributions, also the establishment or availability of emergency savings accounts. Um, these are work very much like a 401k plan does currently, um, but it is after tax money and it's uh, set it aside for, for life's emergencies, life happens. Um, and your employer has the option of matching that as well should they choose. Now, the, um, the, the other areas that I consider to be important is with 529 plans, these are money you have set aside for children going to college. They can be now be rolled into a Roth IRA, whereas previously you had to pay taxes on the money, any money that wasn't used. So if, if your child does not use all of it, for example, they get a full scholarship, um, then um, you can roll that money into a Roth IRA for them and not have to pay taxes on all the growth, which is the whole advantage of the 529 plan. Um, the savers match, this is something that the government is going to be doing. If you are earning less than money currently, um, you know, less than typical, $71,000 for a, a married couple, for example, um, the federal government is going to be putting in, contr contributing towards your savings as well which is kind of exciting. And the last thing is the retirement savings lost and found. Now, what this is, is a database that is being put together of all the different companies that hold retirement accounts. And it's gonna be a listing. So what will happen is you can go in and tell them, you know, my name is, and they will tell you, you have retirement accounts here, 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 and here, and the contact information to get in touch with those people. So if you used to work for a job some years ago and you had a 401k and you can't remember who it was through, you can go here and find that money again so that uh, you can take advantage of it. Now, some of the ways that we work with people on um, saving their money and protecting their money, this is a, where we were talking about playing a little bit of defense or you know um, lowering the risks, is uh, using annuities. Um, these are typically after-tax contributions. The money does grow tax-deferred, um, and you have no contribution limits. So a lot of people take advantage of these where it's similar to a Roth IRA. Um, you're not getting any uh, um, uh, tax deductions or anything like that. You will have to pay income tax when you withdraw the money down the road, but you're not limited should you happen to be blessed with a higher in income. Um, some of the annuities also offer guaranteed returns, which is um, very frequently quite exciting for, for people. Now, the different types of annuities, these are what are known as deferred annuities. You can get a fixed rate, which works very similar to a CD. You're going to get a set interest rate every year for the term of the annuity. Um, a variable is uh, where you are actually investing in the markets, and there may be charges. Um, this may be right for you, uh, but it is important to know that uh, the variables are not guaranteed not to lose money. Uh, you may lose money in them, and so you want to make sure you understand that before you go into them. With the index, just like the fixed, uh, you are typically guaranteed against loss. Um, there are provisions in there where you could take some risk if you want to, but the majority of index annuities work like fixed annuities with the exception that they are tied to an index as far as how they pay, um, but are guaranteed against losses. Now, other options available to you are taxable investments. This is where you open up a brokerage account, you're purchasing mutual funds, you're purchasing ex uh, exchange traded funds, individual stocks, bonds, this sort of thing. This is where I recommend that you work with an advisor because it is highly detailed in determining which investments you should be getting into and which ones are um, um, you should avoid. Now, three fundamental principles with uh, investing, diversification, asset allocation and dollar cost averaging. I'm gonna go into each of these individually uh, a little bit deeper. Now with diversification, this is where you're investing in a number of different places so that you are not all exposed to one thing. So if you put all of your money in the automobile sector, for example, and something terrible happens that causes the automobile sector to go down, you are dealing, you know, you're exposed to some possibility of substantial losses. Whereas if you only have a little bit of your money in that market, for example, the rest of your money is protected against that potential loss. Um, 
With diversifying, you can see also that an individual investment that's paying 6% um, over uh, 200,000 over 25 years would grow to 858,000. But if you put in investments that are earning 6, 8, and 10% as well as zero, uh, you just have it in a checking account, for example, the actual accumulation will be higher at $909,000. So diversifying does give you an edge in the marketplace. And like I said, it avoids the risk of losing your money. Um, now, asset allocation, this is very similar to diversification. It's just a systematic approach. And this is determining an efficient mix that Ken and I will be able to do for you in determining here's what percentage you should have of your assets in each of the different categories. Um, for how your situation is, your tolerance for risk, and what you're trying to achieve. So personalizing that asset allocation comes from what is your goal, what is the time frame to that goal, um, and what is your tolerance for risk? Should you be more conservative? Can you be more aggressive? Should you be somewhere in the middle? Now, a conservative asset allocation model, for example, you can see half of it is in bonds, which is your uh, more conservative side of uh, the investment matrix with 30% of it in stocks, which is considered to be more aggressive. Now, over a 20-year time frame, you can see that over the last 20 years, from 2002 to 2021, now this includes 2008, many of you remember that, the worst year, which was 2008, the, the, this portfolio was down 13.4%. For many of you, I think a, down, a loss of 13.4% in 2008 would, be a, would have been a big victory compared to what actually happened. On average, it earns 6.6%. The best it's done is 20%. But the um, idea, as you can compare it to an aggressive portfolio, where you have 75% in stocks, you can see the best year is much higher at almost 28%. The worst year, which was 2008, was down 29%, averaging a higher rate of return of 8.7%. But it's a much um, wilder ride. I mean, you have higher highs and higher lows. Um, which is is creating a little bit more of a, a roller coaster in your investments. So you need to be more comfortable with those with those uh, ricocheting returns. Now, how much risk can you stand? I mean, in the workbooks there is a, a, a questionnaire which you'd be able to use that'll help you determine what your risk tolerance is, and I encourage you to fill that out. Um, your time horizon and when you are planning to use this money. Let's say when you're planning to retire. If you were planning to retire, let's say in 2008, you can see where the blue line is way, way down. Um, had you been all in, in stocks, this would have been a horrible situation. And you would, frankly, have had to wait or worked another year or two. Otherwise, you would have had a devastation of your retirement portfolio. Um, had you transferred much of it over to a playing defense, I call it, in the last three to five years, you can see had you done that in like 2002 or 2003, moved it over to the T-bills of the corporate bonds, those are the gold and orange lines, you would have not taken the damage that many people in the stock market did during 2008. Um, so playing defense as you're getting closer to your goal is a very smart move. So dollar cost averaging, um, this is a great strategy and fortunately it falls right into how most people save their money. Because you typically, like if you're working a job, you typically get the same paycheck every other week. So you're able to set the same amount of money every other week. And this is what dollar cost averaging is. You're putting the same amount in on a regular interval over a regular basis. So let's say you're saving $100 a month. The market is at $6 a share when you start. Now in month two, it drops all the way down to three. Well, as you will notice, what's happening is the number of shares that you're buying, even though you put in the same $100, you're getting twice as many shares at 33 up. So now as the market works its way back up and then moderates again, you can see the average there, you've accumulated 107 shares, whereas had you been just the same amount, put it in all at once, you would have only received 100. So you have more money because you saved over time instead of just putting it all in a lump sum. So developing this strategy, this you can see, you want to get together with somebody like Ken and I periodically, or you can do it yourself to review that portfolio. Is it still where we should be? For example, let's say we put a portion of it using the auto industry again because we thought it was going to do real well. Well, it looks like that run is about over now. So maybe you want to move it out of automotive and move it over to energy or to computers or another, another area like that. You want to look at it on a regular basis. Um, if you've had a major lifestyle change, if you just retired, if you just had a child, um, 
a lot of these different things will affect how you should be investing your portfolio. So you want to take a look at it yourself or you want to meet with an advisor like Ken or I to go through and determine what changes, if any, should be made. Preparing for the unexpected. This goes back to that emergency fund. I always preach that an emergency fund is the most important investment you can make. Um, but in this situation, we're talking about insurance, for the specifically life insurance and long-term care. The life insurance is for if you pass away earlier than expected when you've not yet reached your goals, but you still want your loved ones to be able to live the life that they had hoped to live and carry on without you. Um, so it's providing for those loved ones, covering unexpected expenses such as long-term care. Many people use it to fund a, a business strategy. Uh, if you have a partnership, for example, if one of you passes away, you want to make sure that that person's family is taken care of. So maybe a buy-sell strategy would work. Now, long-term care, 70% of the people that are reaching 65 today are going to need some form of long-term care, whether it's somebody coming to visit them in the form of home health aides, or whether they have to go the unfortunate full process of moving into a, a nursing home. This is something that is very expensive and you need to be prepared for and consider now. There are a number of different strategies you can use and Ken and I can talk to you those, whether it's buying long-term care insurance or life insurance with long-term care availability within it. Um, there's a lot of different things you can do. So what can you do to, today? Well, commit to developing and keeping your retirement savings plan a high priority. Make it important to you. Start saving now. If you started saving when you're 20, an average $3,000 a year, you're going to have about $679,000 beginning at, you know, at uh, uh, 65 when you reach your retirement. If you wait till you're 30 or you wait till you're 45, you can see you're only going to have 120 or 250. A lot different. So the sooner you start, the more money you're going to have. Now, put your knowledge to work. You can do it yourself, you can work with Ken or I, or you can procrastinate, which unfortunately many people will do. Um, the idea with that is with Ken and I, we're going to help you do the strategy, but we're also going to motivate you. We're going to call you and say, we need to get together and see what's going on. Are you saving the money, even if you're doing it yourself? Um, are you saving the amount of money? I frequently tell people, well, yeah, I'm saving $200 a month. I've been doing it for a year. Well, I'll ask them, how much do you have? And they'll tell me they've got $400. Well, what that tells me is they may be saving $200 a month, but they're taking it back out and that's defeating the purpose. So we want to help you. We want to make sure that you are doing the absolute best you can for you as well as for your loved ones so that when it's your turn to retire, you can retire the way you want to retire in control of your money. Um, we're going to be taking questions now. Um, if you have any questions, please type them in in the upper right corner of the box. You should see a, a button there that uh, talks about the being able to type in a question and put it there. And we'll be taking those questions now um, and see what questions you have at this point. Where'd you go? So the very first question here is, is there a fee to meet with an advisor? Um, and the answer to that is no, there is not. It is, uh, there's no cost, there's no obligation to sit down and talk with Ken or I. Uh, now I say that with a, an asterisk, so to speak, in that that is 100% true, but there are certain investments that may involve a fee down the road. Um, I always encourage people to let them know, this is what would cause a fee, but this is also another way, another alternative which may not be as good, but doesn't have a fee so that you are able to make the choices that are best for you. So what, uh, another question here, what are your fees again? Um, we do not charge for consultations. We sit down with you and talk to you um, at no cost at all. Um, there are some investment products, um, mutual funds, for example, that um, uh, may have a fee involved with them, but we'll be able to explain that to you as we go. So this is a lot of information. Can I have the slides? Yes, you can. We are going to email these slides as well as a copy of the presentation to each of you um, that signed up for it.
So can you discuss anything about inherited beneficiary IRAs? Yes, we can. Um, with inherited IRAs, this is when somebody passes away and leaves you as the beneficiary to that IRA. Now, depending on whether or not it was your spouse that left it to you, or whether it was somebody else, somebody other than your spouse, there are different rules that determine that. Um, I will be glad to get into those individually um, because it can get detailed in determining which one is yours. But the long and short of it is you have inherited that. If it is a traditional IRA, it is pre-tax. Um, you have limitations in regards to if it's not from your spouse, you have to begin withdrawing that money earlier than a typical one that you may have opened and saved into yourself. Um, there are some strategies people use, such as taking a withdrawal and um, simultaneously um, making a deposit into a traditional IRA in your own name. That drains the inherited IRA, but gives you the opportunity to then deduct that amount so that you break even with each one. Um, and I will be glad to, or Ken will be glad to sit down with you to um, go through, depending on your situation, exactly what the best strategy for you will be. Um, so another question here, should taxes be taken out of your social security check monthly? Um, Ken, did you want to answer that one? Uh, the one thing I have learned is to be very careful. We are not tax professionals. Um, so any specific tax questions, we really like to defer to your tax professional, like your CPA. So the next question, um, it's a lot of concern about it. Is there a fee to meet with your advisor? Um, no, there is not. Um, I think that's it. I believe that's all the questions I have here. I will be glad to go through um, and answer any individual questions as Ken would as well. Um, and with that way, we will be glad to get in touch with you so that we can uh, sit down with you at a time that's convenient for you and work through which, um, which process is gonna be the best for you in your situation. So hopefully, you guys are doing fantastic, and we look forward to meeting each of you individually. Um, if you see us in the branches, please stop in and say hello. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.